Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm so glad that you've joined us for worship this morning from your homes and wherever you are. I do need to say that we are recording this worship service on Wednesday morning. So it's Wednesday for me, um, the morning after election night. And I did what I said I wasn't going to do. I stayed up way too late to watch results. And this morning as I speak, we still don't know the outcome of who the, net, who the president will be uh, moving forward. So it's a very uncertain time and you can feel the anxiety and just this bizarre feeling, um, or I can, everywhere uh, today. And so I don't know what the circumstances will be on Sunday when we're worshiping together and you're watching this, but I do know in this moment, I am needing to choose to breathe deeply, um, to be grounded in God. Um, one of the things I love about our Lord is we can tell God the truth. <laughs> right now, I think part of what makes this election that is so close um, and so divided in our nation um, 
so bizarre too is just knowing that that it is such a divide we don't know we don't even necessarily trust our thoughts to everyone um, like right now just reeling with so much information I don't know who I can say what to or process with one of the things I love about God is that God knows us fully I don't need to justify my thoughts or my opinions God already knows me completely better even than I know myself and so today we choose to be grounded in God to breathe deeply of God's grace to look to Jesus and and where is God God is always with those who are most oppressed those who are hurting those who are vulnerable so I take some hope in that this morning even though so much is still uncertain when it comes to the goodness of knowing that God is with us, we can be grounded in God, I turned this morning to a familiar passage, Psalm 139, and I'm going to be reading just the first few verses from the message version because they bring me hope and strength during this very strange time and difficult time. Oh God, investigate my life. Get all the facts firsthand. I'm an open book to you. Even from a distance, you know what I'm thinking. You know when I leave and when I get back, I'm never out of your sight. You know everything I'm going to say before I start the first sentence. I look behind me and you're there, then up ahead and you're there too. Your reassur reassuring presence coming and going. Friends, welcome to worship. It is good to be joined together in God's presence. We're glad you're with us. Let us worship God.
Yes, He loves us. Oh, He loves us. And now let us join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, you made us in your own image and redeem us through Jesus Christ, your Son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. O oh God, we are broken and hurting and afraid. O oh God, will you heal our brokenness by the power and the grace of Jesus? O oh God, we pray you take away the arrogance and hatred that infect our hearts and break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love. And through our struggle and confusion, Lord, work to accomplish your purposes on earth, that in your time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, at this time, I want to thank you for your continued generosity. We are so grateful for the way you continue to give to this church and the ministries and missions of our church. So thank you for that. And I invite you now to give as an act of worship because God is generous. We too want to be generous with our lives. And so you may give by sending in a check or going online to give. And I also ask you to fill out the pledge uh, form online if you have not yet done that. We are grateful for your partnership and for your gifts. Thank you. Good morning, friends, and welcome again to the gathering. My name is Will McLean, and I have the privilege of being the pastor of this community and being the preacher today. I preach in a really unique and odd time in that we film our worship services on Wednesday morning. So at the time of this preaching, it's undecided who the next president of the United States of America will be. Uh, we know it's a close election, there's tensions and anxieties all across the country. And so it's a unique experience for me as a preacher to know that it is very well likely that there will be news updates that you know that I don't know right now. And so in this moment of my not knowing, I trust and lean into the foreknowledge of God and the wisdom of the church. And so this morning, we will read together the gospel text that's appointed in our lectionary, meaning by that, the scripture that will be read in churches all across the world today, regardless of political outcome. And we will hear one of the apocalyptic parables of Jesus in Matthew's gospel toward the end of Jesus's ministry. He begins to talk about the last things. And I, I feel a particular resonance with this because the most asked question I have received pastorally this year uh, from you or from people who have never been a part of a church community before but know enough to know something is this. They ask, is this the end? So friends, this morning we get to hear the word of Jesus Christ as he preached in his last week on earth about the end of all things. Hear now the word of God, according to the Gospel of Matthew. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with the lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. 
But the wise replied, no, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, Jesus says, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? I need your prayers today. A good and gracious God, I empty myself to you this day. I empty myself to receive your word that I might share good news to your people. You, O God, are not surprised by any of the events of this world, and yet you are always bringing about surprise and renewal and the interruption and inbreaking word and power of your Holy Spirit. And so, God, might you provide what your people need to hear this day, and might your word not return to you empty, but rather, O oh God, might it provide the inspiration and the fire and the transformation that your people need this day. All this we ask in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So last uh, Friday afternoon, after picking my daughter up from ECP, the child care program here at church, I was greeted with an unusually usual sight. Uh, my entrance to the home was completely blocked by a mountain full of Amazon Prime boxes. Those boxes were filled with survivables, things like diapers and toilet paper and paper towels and hand sanitizer and Clorox wipes. And friends, if in any other year you were to see this image and you were to see the blocked entrance and this mountain of boxes, you would be concerned about me. You might even go about calling me a prepper. And yet in 2020, this kind of over-preparation is simply wisdom. Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is like a bridegroom who's delayed for his own wedding. There's ten bridesmaids. Five of them over-prepared. They were expecting him to be late, and so they brought some extra flasks of oil. There's another whole group of five bridesmaids who expected that the bridegroom would arrive right on time, and so they brought just enough oil. All ten of the bridesmaids fell asleep, and then the bridegroom came upon his way, and they all woke up, and the five who had overprepared were able to light their lamps, and the other five were sent to scramble. Those five who were overprepared entered into the great wedding feast, and the five who were underprepared did not receive welcome at the door to that great banquet feast. I'll be honest with you, I've always had issue with this parable for two particular reasons. The first, I've never ever known in my life or experience and practice of ministry, I've never known a bridegroom to be late. Trust me y'all, I've seen so many bridal parties be late. In fact, I would say getting half of the bridal party there on time, you're doing pretty well. I've been a part of weddings where the bride is late, most notably my own cousin, who left me hanging up there at the altar with her anxious and sweating uh, bridegroom for 17 minutes in the heat and the humidity of a June Arkansas wedding while she was getting one last change to her makeup. I've seen bride, bridal parties be late, I've seen brides be late, but I have never in my life seen a delayed bridegroom. They are typically the ones who are anxiously sweating the seconds before the chiming of that hour, uh, standing right next to the officiant. So that's my first issue. My second issue is that I just don't quite understand why the foolish can't, or why the wise can't share their oil with the foolish. So I go on a lot of backpacking trips, and Every time I go on a backpacking trip, I have a very intentional plan of over-preparing for the sake of bartering with the underprepared. Because it's inevitable that on day two, one of the novices with whom we're hiking has already eaten all their food, or they've realized that they didn't put new batteries in their flashlight. And so I have bartering power, 
of getting out of ch uh, camp chores at night as I trade with the underprepared that they do the chores and I give them out of the glorious provision of my overpreparedness. And that's just the argument from logic and simple economics, let alone Christ's command, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's in Matthew chapter 7 in the Sermon on the Mount. Did those five wise bridesmaids forget the commands of the bridegroom? I guess that's where I want to really launch into the heart of this message, is that maybe the reason why this is only in Matthew's gospel and not in Mark and Luke and John's is that it simply doesn't make any sense, which is exactly where God's inbreaking word comes to us today. How we might be a people who live faithfully and hopefully and lovingly in a world that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It's not every day that I really feel the weight of the collective grief of this year, but honestly, y'all, whenever I have, it's, it's unraveled me. It's, done, it's undone me for days on end. Like, I'm, I'm not a functional, effective person, even as I claim my faith. Just the weight of everything. When, when you zoom out of the microcosm of my experience and my personal disappointments of, and frustrations for what this year has been, and I zoom out and I say, wow, 1.2 million lives have been ended by a virus whose onslaught could be slowed if we were all a little more selfless. Or in, in our country, the, the wildfires on the West, West Coast, uh, the too many hurricanes to name on the Gulf Coast, and yet people still think global warming is a hoax. An election that has revealed the deepest divisions of this country, and not only that, we have witnessed a sitting United States president undermine the processes of democracy that are the deepest core of who we are as Americans. And the deaths, the deaths that never like, cease to stop, amidst even all of our cries for justice. Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, the long litany of those whose blood cries out and reveals not only institutional racism in our country and in all of our systems of being, but also reveals the closed ears and eyes and hearts of disciples in Christ's church who refuse to repent because they are afraid of how it will cost them. Y'all, the world does not make a whole lot of sense to me right now. And maybe it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you. And it didn't make a whole lot of sense to Matthew. And the people Matthew was pastoring when he first put pen to papyrus to tell the story about Jesus. The temple in Jerusalem had been burned to the ground. Uh, Rome had sacked and destroyed Jerusalem. Christians across the whole Roman Empire, they were losing their jobs. Their property was being confiscated. They were being crucified. They were even, even being thrown to wild beasts as spectator sport. And so Matthew was grappling with this question that was on the ground and on the hearts of God's people. And this is the question. How can we yet live in hope amidst the despair of Christ's delay? I've shared this with you once or twice, and it's become a mantra from my life. A common refrain that one of my favorite seminary professors, Jeremy Begbie, would always share with us. And that is, as Christians, we don't hope for the future. We have a hope from the future. What he meant by that is, as Christians, we don't hope in the inevitable progress of the human race, that things are just always going to get better in this a trajectory of goodness. We don't put our hope and the promises of, of an over-promising politician. We don't even put our hope in the confidence that our faith will conquer all our fear and everything will be rosy and okay. Our hope as Christians is very particular. Our hope is in a once crucified, now risen Savior named Jesus, the Messiah. 
Our hope is in the one who shares our burdens. Our hope is in the one who grieved at the tomb of his friend Lazarus. Our, our hope is in the one who was tested and tried in every way that we have been tested and tried and yet was perfected in love and faithfulness to God. We have a very particular hope from the future in Jesus. The one who by the power of the Holy Spirit is available to us right now even as we look forward to the day when he will return and all will be made well. Our hope, friends, is not for the future. Our hope is from the future in Jesus Christ. And so a word to the wise. Do not delay in walking the walk of Jesus Christ. Today is the day to take the bold step of faith out of the boat and to do what God has been summoning you to do for years, maybe to make that bold and drastic career change, maybe to go public with your friends or your family about how God has been at work in your life. Uh, today is the day, not tomorrow, today is the day to be about the work of reconciliation in your spheres of influence, to do the hard work of confession and repentance and forgiveness, to break down a wall of resentment and to heal an old and long-standing grudge. Uh, today is the day to tangibly and practically and sacrificially love your neighbor. Today is the day to bridge the gap between what you confess with your mouth and how you live your life so that we all might be a people who walk so closely in the footsteps of Jesus. We're covered in his dust. And in all of these small, seemingly inconsequential decisions, what we are experiencing is that even when we cannot see it in ourselves, the Holy Spirit is transforming us, is transforming you is stocking you up, you might even say, that you have the necessary oil to offer a living witness of hope in a world that does not make any more sense. But what about, that's a word to the wise. What about a word to the foolish? What about a word to the unprepared? What about a word to the ones who are left to scramble by the wise? Because, y'all, the, the preacher in me, there's just something about Jesus. There's just something about this one who said that God is like a shepherd that would leave the 99 in pursuit of the one. Or what Apostle Paul says, that the foolishness of God is wiser even than human wisdom. There's something about who I know God to be in Jesus Christ to say there has got to be a word of invitation for the fool in each and every one of us. So maybe it is that the greatest foolishness of those foolish bridesmaids was that they listened to the wise and scattered and scrambled to buy something that money can never provide. Maybe the greatest foolishness of the bridesmaids was indeed that they did not know the Lord as a God of grace, always ready to provide what we need than we are even to ask. You wonder what would have happened if they had simply remained there and invited the bridegroom into their lack of preparation, into their emptiness, into their darkness, into their distraction and despair in his delay. You wonder. You wonder if indeed they closed the door to a surprise of grace before the door of that banquet was ever shut on them. For the gospel of Jesus Christ, friends, is that even in all of our stocking up of good works and faithful discipleship, even in all of our preparation for Christ's return, we will never be able to fully prepare our hearts for the joy that is that great getting up day, that day when all of the years and centuries and millennia of waiting feel but a spare moment in time when we finally see our lover face to face. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All oh, things are past away. Your love I stay the same. Your constant grace remains. Things that we thought were dead are breathing in life.
again You cause your sun to shine on darkest nights For all that you've done we will pour out Our love this will be our anthem song
The Bible ends with a promise, a promise from the bridegroom. He says, I am surely coming soon. For the wise among you, might you not be discouraged by these troubling times. Might you hold faith and might you hold the faith and be strong in your faith and walk with Jesus. And to the fools among us, the fool in each and every one of us, might you surrender your emptiness, your lack of preparation to the God of grace who provides each and everything that we need. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.